My name is Monk Rowe. We're in the Jazz Archive at Hamilton College, and I'm welcoming John Weber to campus. Welcome. Thank you. Our 200th anniversary. As you can tell, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's a pleasure to be here. My gosh, I understand it. It's a parade. There's bagpipes. There's yeah. tons of people. There. Bicentennial. How many colleges can say that? In really? And uh, but I've been I've been practicing this little bit because I I can. I can use this intro with you and no one else. Uh, John Weber, heavy metal guitarist, whose life was changed by a big band. Yes. You have done your reading. Yes, that's exactly what I was a heavy metal guitarist. I was 16 playing with guys older than me in bars, playing heavy metal. I, God knows what where, where I would have, had I pursued that path, I, I may be deaf or dead or who knows what. But I happened to get a phone call from a gentleman named Mark Cleckley. This is in Milwaukee, where I grew up. I was 16, and uh, he said, well, our, our big band piano player just we quit. We have a big band that rehearses every Sunday, and we need somebody. We, we, I heard you're a pretty good jazz piano player. Well, I'm, I'm a guitar player now, so I hadn't touched a piano in two years. But you started on piano. I did, at three. Yeah. Okay, and then you went to the guitar. Yes, I mean, again, you know, every kid has this, this struggle, you know, do I play baseball, do I play a musical instrument and get beaten up for playing tuba or accordion or whatever instrument. <laughs> yeah. is. Even piano wasn't as cool as guitar. For some reason, guitar, I thought I have to be a guitar player, which it helped. Uh, I sort of learned how to have some dexterity in my left hand. I, I, I paid attention to it more than I would have otherwise, I suppose. But heavy metal guitar, that was where I was, and thank God, Mark Cleckley. What a, what, a, what a great name and what a great person and uh, mentor in my life he turned out to be. Mark called and said, oh, I, I need a piano player. I said, well, he, his magic words were, if you hate it, you, you never have to come back, but check it out once. I did, and it, it changed my life because there were musicians who were all older than me. They were all college and up, and I was 16, and I walked in. And I didn't know how to read music. I was a self-taught oh. you know, piano player, and but they, they threw, the, I remember the first chart in front of me, it was Thad Jones, don't get sassy, it had to be 15 pages. Chord symbols, uh, it was you know, a professional level chart, and I looked at it, what's C sharp plus nine, 13, what is, what's that? And I had perfect pitch, so, and, you know, doing the Milli Vanilli piano for a while, I didn't know what to, like, I, I was faking it. They were all so good. Oh my gosh, I, 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 it was a blues, so I could hear that much. And then solo. Now what? So I, I faked it, and end of the I was I almost slunk out of there. I was so embarrassed because it just it, two hours of this. These people were so good, and I was this kid. What do I? I thought, jeez, I, I, I should have. I wish I'd taken those lessons. But uh, the leader, Mark Cleckley, said, "Hey, that was, that was terrific." He said, "For a first shot out, that was great." I said, "I'm sorry." disrupt your practice. He said, no, come back next week. Here's a couple of books that might help you. Hmm. Books with pictures of hands oh. playing the chords. All 97 chords, every key, oh. every inversion. That's what that's called? Oh, that's what an F sharp oh. flat 13, sharp 9 sounds like and looks like. I could do that and studied. Came back the next week a little bit faster. You know, still awful, but within six months, just through sheer repetition, I got a little bit faster, a little bit I, I could have probably read the Tonight Show band charts at that point because I was doing nothing else. Got into it. You, uh, from what I read, you sound like one of those people who would have had, would have driven a classical piano teacher crazy, because you would have heard the piece and been able to play a lot of it without reading it. Mm -hmm. Did you resist learning to read music? Um, I didn't have to because I was learning things by ear very quickly. We had seven kids in the family. I was the baby. So it was just a luxury we really couldn't afford. And mm. we, we got my mother's, um, my mother's mom's player piano. We inherited that from my grandma. She was oh. quite a bit old. She was 80 when I was born. And at grandma's house, there would be the player piano with the rolls. Remember the, the, the look like a Scott Towel sure. you put in with the holes in you pump like a Stairmaster. Yeah play songs, errors forced through, and the, and the keys go down. So mesmerized by this at Grandma's house, Grandma bequeathed her piano to my mom. So that's in the house. So I've got that <laughs> uh, with which I practiced all the time. Um, 
and I'm trying to get back to the original question to to I had a nice way of tying this reading that. reading music the, the reading wasn't wasn't um, I never had to do it because I got lazy with it because I, I would hear something on the radio and I'd, I'd play it because again when you're small enough you don't have this adult problems that you know you don't have, you haven't yet stared the grim face of adulthood down head on with its mortgage and car payments and alimony or whatever you got to worry about when you get to be a grown up. So yeah, nothing but just oh, the piano. It's just fun. So that that was nearly a hundred percent of my waking day. Wow. So yeah, and so no, I, I so reading um, kind of I was blindsided by the reading situation when I was sixteen and found a solution to it immediately thanks to Mark Levin. Was there a point where you said uh, I want to be a musician? I want to make a living. When I was a musician, three. when, when I was, you were three, I was three. I told my mother, and she told she told me this. She said, "John, you said I'm, I'm going to be a piano player, whether you like it or not. I'm going to be a piano player the rest of my life, whether you like it or not." Wow, because I, I really want. In fact, I, I, she saved I a little green three by five card where I scribbled in pencil. Someday I will fly all over the globe and play piano. And I had a, she gave me a globe. My mother, so I would just spin the globe around. I'd say, I'm going to play there, and I'm going to play piano there, and I'm going to play there. But what if they don't speak any English in Mauritania or wherever I was pointing at? Well, I'll, I'll just play piano. I don't have to talk. I'll just play. And guess what? Well, when I go to these places, that's exactly what happens. I, I, would go, I remember the first gig I did overseas years and years ago. It was in Estonia. Estonia, and I played... Uh, I played something, and I remember the moment. It was a hilarious moment uh, when, for no apparent reason, I decided to quote da, 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 Yankee Doodle. For no apparent reason, it just fit yeah. into the the chord changes, and everybody laughed. I thought, that just happened. It, it, that was it. That was exactly. That's what I want. I want to communicate the close encounter that you know, yeah. brings Spielberg back in. Yeah, that's really cool. And I I. Um I followed a, a little bit of that path, but I have a feeling you're all that, plus with your heavy metal guitar, really congealed for you. Because <clears throat> I have this weird thing with guitars, like guitar players don't necessarily know what they're doing. That's my sense of it. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're not good. I mean, I've played with some guitar players who can't, who, if you ask them the chord, they'll show your, here's what it is, they show the hand, yet their ears are so good, and it, I, I'm jealous of that. Oh, I, I understand completely, guitar is sort of what piano was about 100 years ago, a lot of people had access to one, I mean, 100 years ago, uh, people, almost every house, or a lot of houses had a piano in the parlor, with, and everybody could read music on it, and today, um, piano is just a large, bulky instrument and it's easier for people to have a guitar and for some reason it seems that they can they can instantly play music on it uh, in, in, in a way that sounds pretty much like what they hear on the radio. Mm -hmm. In other words, and, and I don't want to say that the bar has been lowered that far that you can now play music from the radio, but I guess I am saying that, aren't I? Because, I mean, I can't help but say, because it is it is easier. You're playing fewer chords, you're playing, you're not reading any notes all it's to play A minor and E minor and G and C. Um, you can pretty much get by with that much, and and, and even less today with the synthesized. I just hit a button and yeah. it plays for you. But I understand. I, just, I understand the the entire um, what, how you feel about, about guitar, and I think the same thing sometimes that you can just kind of do some tricks, and it sounds very guitaristic. And it mm -hmm. sounds very familiar, and it's oh, okay. I, that, that sounds that sounds like a, a great guitar player. And you can sound like a great guitar player, I guess, easier than you can sound like a great, great, great piano player. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's following sort of that what line of saying. reasoning. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you got you got a fuzz box, to, you got distortion right. and all the, the gizmos and, and and the volume at uh, right. hundred decibels. So I'm not likely to see you in a ad for a music college saying you should come here because my career really started here. You were able to sort of bypass that whole jazz education at a college level thing, or not? Yes, I. Well, I ended up auditing a number of classes when I went to the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. I went for four years at eight different majors because I, I thought 
you know, uh, the voice of reason, my parents entered in and said, well, you know, we, we like your music, but, you know, something to think about, uh, plan B. The fallback on You know, <laughs> and so, okay, counting and mathematics, and I'm good at, uh, okay, what else? Oh, geez. You know, but there would be the piano over in the corner, and I'd think, okay, I'll play for five minutes. And I'd go, oh, four hours later, I'm still playing. I, I managed to get decent enough grades, but hmm. I thought, I'm going to be a piano player the rest of my life. As I warned my mother at age three, I'm going to be a piano player, and this is what I'm going to pursue. But no, the, the jazz uh, academic route is something that I, I missed entirely. I ended up writing charts for other students. In other words, I remember doing a 110-piece orchestration for a woman I had a big crush on. And, uh, and uh, sometimes you write, I'd write big band charts for, for Mark Cluckley's band uh -huh. once in a while. And, you, you, and, and, and other combos. I had a quintet we opened up for people like Pat Matheny and yeah. Buddy Rich. So you just learned about voicing and ranges and all that from, from listening and talking to the players? Yes, trial and error. And I'd ask him, I'd say, what, what is, what's the highest note you want to hit on a tenor saxophone? Oh, you get to this point, then you hit an altissimo. Okay. All right. What's uh, what's the best range for you know, a trombone? What's what's the toughest position? Seventh. Stay away from the meter. Yeah. And then, and then just and then uh, met Henry Mancini of all people. I was playing a gig in a hotel. I was quite young, and and he walks in. What do you what do you what do you give him? I have a game with my best friend, uh, John Ramirez, back in Chicago. We call it, What do you give him? Which means if somebody famous comes in. What do you have ready for them that's going to blow them away? We also have a game called What Don't You Give Them. For example, Francis Ford Coppola walks in. Do not give him Godfather 1, Godfather 2. Don't, don't do that. But, for example, if, if Paul McCartney were to walk into the game, what do you get? Well, you know, I'm not going to give him a Beatles song. I'm not going to even give him a post Beatles song. I'm going to lay this one out. Um, do, you, do I have time to give this uh, uh, 30 second anecdote? Yeah. Um, are you familiar with uh, the composer Jack Lawrence? No. Jack Lawrence wrote a, a string of uh, pop hits in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Any case, one of which he wrote for his friends John and Louise Eastman about a daughter, Linda, who's about kindergarten age. It's 1946. And he wrote a song for the kid. Oh, how's it going? Her name was Linda. When I go to sleep, I never found sheep. I found all the charms about Linda. Lately, it seems, in all of my dreams, I dream with my arms about Linda. You've heard that song, perhaps. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of Lindas. They, they, they listen to the song. That's nice. They can hear a cash register ringing. And lo and behold, they did release it, and it became a... Buddy Clark sang it. Enormous hit. It was on the, the, the hit parade at least two months. It was top of the charts much of that time. Tons of girls named Linda after that. All right, fast forward. The girl for whom that song was written, Linda. March 12, 1969, guess what she does? She marries Paul McCartney. So, he owns that song. He bought the rights for that song. Now, if Paul McCartney wanders in, what do you give him? <laughs> you give him Linda. So, in any case, Henry Mancini walks in, what do you give him? I started laying all these tunes on him from his film scores that he thought, who knows this? He even, at one point, he's got his arms crossed and he's kind of half smiling at me. What a great guy he was. April 16, 1924. Uh, <laughs> I observe his birthday. Um, any case, and, and June 14th, uh, 1984, his death, I think. Yeah. But uh, uh, he had, uh, um, he, he, he's, he's, come here, sir, how old are you? I'm 25. He said, how do you know so many of my songs? I said, well, you're, you're a famous, famous guy. Of course I know your songs. I said, what was that second last one? Well, that was Blue Satin. He did that with Jay Livingston and Ray Evans, the guys who were born six weeks apart in 1915. And he loved it. He loved it, and we started uh, laughing about something. That was, yeah, it was in the, the Mr. Lucky TV show. I remember I said, yeah, I do. So we wrote those in five minutes sometimes. Oh. Anyway, um, how did we get on to Henry Mancini? I'm trying to remember how we... Well, we I'm not sure. You were talking about what do you give him? Yeah, what, what do you give him? So Henry, Hank, Hank Mancini, he came back the next three nights, the next two nights, three nights in a row, and I'm going to do a show. He gave me a book. This is what, this is the reason I brought oh, yeah, him up. He gave me a book called Sounds and Scores which had um, exact, the range of every instrument, um, the range in which they're comfortable. All the things I ever wanted to know about orchestration were in that book. So that helped a ton. Um, I'd learned a little bit. It, it sort of backed up everything that I had learned on my own, but uh, this, there it was in black and white. And this, this is, that's my Bible. I refer to that often. You know, there's nothing like that feeling of pre-finale pre or Sibelius. 
of writing a piece and you know you check it at the piano but you're never really sure it's going to work until all those human beings get there and they read it and you're going you're, you're right and, and there, there are people who write vertically and there are people who write horizontally Mancini for example writes vertically meaning every you could take any cross section of any conductor score and it's going to be a fabulous chord he thinks that way he, just, he thinks vertically and Duke uh, Ellington for example thought horizontally Every, everybody's line had to be something really hip and it somehow works horizontally and I don't know if anybody ever analyzed it that way maybe this is the advantage of not studying music it's just that's the way it sounds to me I think that's a great point because I remember listening to him some recently and I'm I, was, I was trying to figure out what is it that makes him sound like he does and, and that's a very good sort of observation and what you just said too what did you just say uh, like vertically yeah. or horizontally? Yeah, but then line. after that you said not knowing music theory or... Uh, I'll yeah, to, yeah, it's just... It's, there's some advantage to that. In other words, by ear I managed to pick out what, what each individual line was in the Duke score from 1927. It's, oh, that, every, God, every single line works somehow. You know, vertically it may not work quite as well, but, but uh, horizontally everybody's line, everybody's got something cool to play. Mm -hmm. So it keeps them happy in that way. Yeah. And, and Mancini and a number of other composers have, have the technique of writing uh, vertically, which means it, it's, it's pleasing for the conductor and perhaps for a larger audience. I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I should analyze it further. That'd, that'd I wonder if that has to do anything with, you know, Duke knew he was, who, who he was writing for. Yes. And similarly, uh, Henry Mancini even says in his book, if, uh, he says, if you have the luxury of knowing who your players are, there's no greater advantage to a, a, an arranger and conductor than that. Because if you have a swell tuba player who can really get around the tuba, write some tuba parts. Write some cool stuff for them to do. So uh, I guess I guess both answers are right. Though. Yeah. Um, present day, if, if you look at your, I'm, I'm leapfrogging here, but if, if you're doing your taxes at the end of the year, and you're, you know, you're looking at how I make a living. Is there, is it mostly from playing gigs and touring? Uh, does selling CDs come into it? Does writing charts? I mean, how is it divided up for you? Um, since I moved to New York, I write a lot more charts because I, I finally broke down and got the music transcription software. I use Finale. I should learn Sibelius. It's similar. I should know them both. But. Um, I would say when I was living in Chicago until 2006, I was playing, I would say that 99.9% .9 of my income came from playing gigs and touring. And now um, in New York, where there's 80 million crazy ways to make money as a musician, um, I'll play for a vocalist, I'll write out charts for someone, I'll write out arrangements for someone, um, I'll do the radio show. You never know. It, it all, if, so if now, and I do my tax return, as you say, it, it's... I, I look at it and I kind of smile, thinking, "Wow, when did I find time to do all this? All this stuff. This is great." You know, it, 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 as you, your resume builds, and I'm happy about that because I end up learning. Playing for singers is something that a lot of instrumentalists, particularly piano players, think, "Oh, geez, do I have to do this?" But I enjoy it uh, because I'm learning. I always learn new tunes. For example, if I'm doing a gig with a vocalist who is doing 22 numbers, sometimes I have to learn 14 of them. Good. About time. I, I sometimes you need to get your butt kicked to to learn new music, and that's no more dramatic way of being compelled to learn new music is the gig Saturday. You got to have charts ready to go for the, the the band. Who's the more challenging vocalist to work with usually? The the fabulous vocalist or the vocalist who maybe shouldn't be doing this gig. Keep your daughter off the stage, Mrs. Worthington? <laughs> um, the, the latter, uh, because you always want to work with people who are better than you, or people who can do something that you can't do, because mm. then you're learning. If Otherwise, if, if you're just picking somebody up, um, you're spending all your time babysitting, you're not learning mm. anything. Do you, not babysitting. Yeah, you probably get a sense fairly quickly of working with a particular singer like I need to lead this person a little bit, or not, not be too. My substitutions, watch out for them. You yeah. know, right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, I look to people like Nelson Riddle and Axel Stardall, uh, even even people like the film scores like Eric Korngold. And you just listen to what's going on behind the action, and um, I, you know how much you can get away with almost immediately if you start doing stuff and, and they get lost. Um, but that rarely happens out in the art. Usually, they can follow it because they're used to playing with something that sounds kind of. In other words, I, I will stray from from the. the from the standard changes after a chorus or two. Mm -hmm. And the vocalists welcome that and they actually are happy that I'm doing that instead of just playing some basic uh, cotton candy arrangement that's been written bare bones for somebody to mm. play with their hands about this far apart. Oh. When they're about this far apart, it actually sounds a little bit more orchestral for some reason. Mm. And more jazzy and people, I, I, I find that people do, and uh, vocalists do enjoy that. I never play the melody. I remember learning that a long time ago when I was, I played for a vocal jazz group in college, uh, a professor named Robert Porter, great professor out at um, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Yeah, I audited the class. I, I did it because I just wanted to meet girls, I think, but, <laughs> but, I, but, I was, but I was playing for them and I learned, um, again, uh, less is more. Uh, don't try to overplay them, don't try to upstage them. Uh, just. Do your, do your thing. If, if they look good, you look good. And, uh, and, and again, um, a lot of times I'll, I'll actually take my hands completely off the keys and I'll, I'll allow some silence because if there's a vocal person, they're, they're really, that's a, that's a brave thing to do to get up, as I know I was a heavy metal singer too. Getting up and singing in front of a crowd is a brave thing to do. And if a vocalist is doing that and somebody's yapping away in the audience, one way to make them knock it off is to have these moments of silence where you can hear a pin drop, and they'll 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 stop talking. It'll, it happens. It, it's it's a it's a powerful thing, and it makes everybody feel better because they think, how cool are we as an audience to have just done that? And they and they and it's it's a like crack. You immediately are seduced into craving more. I want that. I want I want to want that silent moment again. So yes, silence is golden uh, when you're accompanying a vocalist. Good point. Do you like working more in a just piano vocal or with the bass player and it doesn't even matter? Um, if I'm playing with a vocalist for the very first time, uh, piano is safer. Hmm. Just piano, the more musicians you add, the more chances you take, the, the bigger gamble it is that you're going to hit something that's going to clash with somebody else. I welcome the challenge, but if I'm by myself, um, the chances of everything going right are greater just by sheer laughing statistical chance yeah. and but it's fun it's nothing is more fun than uh, a jam session at a club like Mona's is a place in Alphabet City in New York at Avenue B 13th Street where a bunch of college kids 20 somethings are dressing up in suits and Stetsons and they're playing like Louis Armstrong like Lester Young and they're respecting the whole tradition it's a blast to be around them. Uh, I, why I, was, I, I went that way, but we, we, were, we were talking about something a moment ago. I was just, somebody waved at me from the window. <laughs> I was thrown off. Um, well, you know, we were talking about working with other oh, people. Oh. And we, we did, um, and, and those, those folks work together so often, and they kind of, uh, the, the magical thing that happens sometimes is if, if somebody is singing, for example, somebody who's singing like Billie Holiday or singing like uh, uh, Bessie Smith, which cause it's an amazing club. You have to go this one. Um, the horn players will all of a sudden one of them do 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 do, and everybody ba -da, ba -da, da -da, all of a sudden six horn players are doing that rhythm with some something that fits. Cool. And it sounds almost like an arrangement. And sometimes it even happens vocally. I remember we did uh, "Deed I Do," where suddenly we broke into four-part harmony. I thought I'm going to take the one that's really really high, so nobody will step on my feet. And sure enough, it, it just happened. Sometimes uh, that, that kind of magical thing will happen when you just have nothing to lose. It's three in the morning and you're just hanging out. I'm glad to hear that that's, that happens there because that's the hardest thing to teach in, you know, in jazz school. I think that human interaction and learning the tradition, and doing it on the spot in front of an audience. Yeah, there's a lot of spontaneity. I think, you know, I mean, it's probably today. Uh, as, as, as of the time of this recording, which is 2012, if I'm allowed to mention that. I don't, know, I don't, know, I don't know if you don't, uh, oh, yeah, if, no. if you don't want to you know, mark, this ear, you know, mark something's uh, in time and 
anyway. Um, no, it's uh, today there are more places to get a jazz education than maybe ever before. Um, but again, there's no substitute for just getting on the stand and, and making the stumbles and falls and the wrong turns that you have to make in order to learn uh, how, how to blend. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a guy who seems, uh, from what I've read in some YouTube things, you seem pretty comfortable on stage. I like it that stage. It's yeah. a very it's a very fun place to be, and if I can look people in the eye on stage, that's a blast. If it's a big gigantic venue, and I played some huge ones in my day, <coughs> pardon me. Um, there's something about playing in a room where there's a few hundred people because you can you can look at everybody, and anybody in the audience can get the feeling that if I hadn't been here, it might have been a different kind of a show. Mm -hmm. In this way, in other words. How many times have you been in an audience where you initiated the clapping or you laughed at something and it changed the momentum of the entire performance? Where the person, the front person or some whoever was playing was encouraged and something happened, some spark. And I like those moments and I like, I like the audiences that are small enough where any individual can be that person or to, to trigger something special. I've, I've been on both sides. I've been on stage when it's happened, and I've been in the audience. Did the uh, heavy metal band help you become comfortable on stage? Maybe. Um, it. I'll, I'll, I will tell you this. I, I was um, 14, 15, 16 when I was playing heavy metal, and I playing in bars, playing with where there's grown ups and grown up stuff is going on, and I learned that. I never wanted to consume alcohol at all. I, I think I became allergic to it just by watching. I thought, I don't want to act like that. You know, it's it's fine for people who want to do it. That's fine. They look like they're having a great time. I don't want to look like that. And and I remember the only time I've ever had any a drink on a stage. I was playing. I remember a place called the Estate. I had to be 17 years old in Milwaukee. Little club. It's hot. I was playing. It was probably two in the morning. I'm just doing the thing with the, all the guys and. A um, couple of women at that point. The women are starting to play more jazz even then. Um, and somebody, I said, what are you drinking? I said, uh, ginger ale. Somebody brought me a ginger ale. Pff, just drank it. That was terrible. <sighs> you know. Is it, uh, is it, do you want another? Sure. You know, it's a good, uh, I, had, I had two whiskey sours in about 45 seconds. I didn't know what they were. I, didn't, I honestly did not know what they were. And, you know, it's, the pupils dilated and the 16th became eight triplets and... What happened? I didn't like it. I don't like the experience of being out of control uh, on stage or off. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the heavy metal experience taught me, oh, this is what I don't want to do the rest of my life. Good experience. Yeah, I was glad. It, if, if I hadn't encountered that, who knows? I don't know. Maybe maybe something I would have followed a different route. But uh -huh. it, it just maybe I've, I've still never smoked marijuana in my entire life. What kind of a musician am I? Right? <laughs> what kind of a musician am I? And I don't drink. Although you will probably observe... Younger musicians, people, I'm 51, people younger than me are, the next generation of musicians are the healthiest bunch mm. of people. You know, I mean, Duke's Day at 3 in the morning, let's go get a steak and a bottle of champagne and a, you know, some heroin or whatever. I don't know. I mean, not, not, right. Not, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Musician. But I mean, yeah. it was some very unhealthy things. And today it's, uh, no, I'll have the, uh, the, the vinaigrette, uh, <laughs> black bean soup, and a Caesars and a bottled water healthy can you believe this and that's good I guess maybe it means that musicians are, are have more self-respect I don't know what it is maybe maybe the chances of them doing okay are better than they used to be I mean if you're a jazz musician of a few generations ago it might have been oh a jazz musician Ugh. harumph now it's it's okay to be especially I mean in Europe my gosh if you if you go over there it's just normal an occupation is working in a bank or, uh, you know, selling insurance or something. What do you do? I'm a musician. Oh, okay. Over here, musician. Mm -hmm. it's, there's still a little bit of a stigma, but it's better than it was. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think sometimes that audience in the, in the older days liked the fact that those musicians were going to die young. It's like, let them be that way so we can watch... You know, or then we can tell stories about, you know, like Vix Beiderbeck, of course. He's like, will live on forever, partly because he died so young. Yeah. You know, and 
the tragic hero, I suppose. There is the mystique about the, the dark side, the flirtation with vice that jazz brings. All the, the best jazz photography is this black and white, smoky club basement, sweaty guys going, yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's this whole feeling about it. It's sort of, sort of nocturnal and nefarious and sort of, oh, I've got to, and that's why, that's why people, even here, I'm, I'm um, the most un, uh, un, sub, I'm the most substance-free uh, musician there is, but I like going out to a place at three in the morning because there's something about that life, something about that, that, that energy that, that really uh, attracts me and attracts a lot of people, musicians and non-musicians alike. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about NPR. I have a feeling that there are probably quite a number of piano players who were jealous of you picking up Marion's mantle. That's my guess. I'm, I'm humbled beyond belief that, that, that Marion has, has chosen me to uh, follow her concept uh, into the next generation. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, very happy about it. She started something in 1978 from scratch. There were no jazz radio programs like it. There wasn't one where you brought on a guest, another musician, and they played together and they said, oh, what about that time at the Hickory House? Oh, do you remember at the Palladium when, when Duke was there? Yeah, and Tito Puente walked in. And then Monk was there. They have these stories, these jazz stories that sort of humanize jazz musicians and, and in a little bit take away from, from the mystique <clears throat> and make them human beings. Oh, jazz musicians aren't so brooding and indecipherable as I thought, they're, they're just regular people. And yes, to take on, uh, um, to follow Marion's concept is an honor that I am humble beyond belief. I try to research everything about every guest that I have on the mm -hmm. show. I try to download and study every single piece of music they've ever released. I look for bootlegs, I look for everything on, I mean, if, if, long, if not all else fails, YouTube, and um, everywhere, everywhere I can finally find something about them, back to junior high, uh, you know, newspaper clippings. Because I want to know something, I want to ask something if I possibly can that hasn't been asked before. Marion does this naturally. Marion could just listen to <coughs> someone's records, in those days the albums, and probably you know, iron clothes and bake a turkey and, and you know, write a chart, uh, and then the next day go on the show and say, oh yes, on your eighth album on the second side, and that, that thing you did in your solo, I got a kick on it. She remembers everything. She remembers everything. She's so smart and, and so wonderful and so giving that um, I hope the, the Kennedy Center honors her um, soon and um, yeah. for her contribution. How can you give seven decades plus to this in the, in the manner and style that she has without honoring that? I, I'm, I'm, I keep on saying it, I'm humbled by this. And, I, yeah, I keep scratching my head saying, boy, am I lucky. Why me? I'm delighted. I'm delighted to, to, to do this as long as I can, as long as there, there are people interested in the concept of bringing in a musician and doing not seven needle drops, but seven live performances in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's, that's an extraordinary thing. She, she, again, created out of nothing. They said, if you're a kid in a candy store, what would you do? I don't know, I'd have my friends on, we'd play and talk. Wow. How lucky, how fortunate yeah. is that? So. She's a great lady, and I uh, had the experience of, when I taught high school, having her, I mean, she was doing high school assemblies. This is 1975, and someone booked in this school I was teaching at, and I don't think they even knew who she was. And I said, Mary McPartland is coming to our school. <laughs> And I got some money together and had her come back and play with my junior high kids, you know. I was like, oh my God, she was so, just so giving, like you said. She is, I don't think she ever forgot what it was like to be a kid and to have the wonder and the, and the, and the feeling about improvisation because I think kids naturally <coughs> want to be creative and to, to steer them that way, the way Marion does when she, when she does her clinics and when she's over mm -hmm. the years, I think. I, I definitely, everybody wants to be like her. Hmm. So, how do you choose your guests? Do you choose them? It's half and half. Some of them, when, when I filled in for Marion for about three years, um, they would say, here's somebody who's been on the waiting list for okay. years. And, and then hmm. sometimes they'd say, who do you want to bring on? I, I 
got lucky once in a while and got to choose. Um, and Piano Jazz Rising Stars, um, there are some just people that are, are obvious candidates, like uh, uh, Chris Bowers, for example, who just won the Felonious Monk Piano Competition, mm -hmm. Aaron Deal. Uh, uh, Tremendous uh, young stride piano player, but bebop piano player, arranger. Uh, started out as a classical player until college, as was Stefan Harris, uh, who um, played about 20 instruments. I think every band leader's, uh, high school band leader's dream, the, the, the kid who could play every instrument, because he'd just take the home a trombone and start playing the Pink Panther with the TV. <laughs> but um, so Stefan Harris and, and um, Jason Moran, named the Kennedy Center uh, Jazz. Uh, advisor, so and Hiromi. Hiromi was a blast. Uh, she had a she was fortunate enough in Japan to have um, a music teacher who told her, "Play your hand in exercises, but swing them." How do I swing them? Like this. This is in Japan. You now you would think in Japan we would imagine a very very strict to mm -hmm. play the notes, play the ink. Why don't you swing it? Could you imagine that? Mm -hmm. so, so some people I absolutely had to have on the show. Sachel Vazadani was a great guest. Uh, everybody, everybody I had is Taylor Igesty, Julian Lodge, Grace Kelly. Um, I, I've, I've been really, really fortunate. And how much time do you get to do the show with these people? I mean, in the actual taping of it. Um, if you get lucky, uh, you can do it. Well, we have to stop and start because um, it's no longer a situation where you have two pianos next to each other anymore and you can just sit at the piano. Now it's done. Where the the interviewing is is we're, we're in, in in the booth and then oh. we uh, say we say well uh, what about this uh, tune and, oh yeah okay I'd love to play they play it and they stop and so you know a couple hours and you can yeah. get every, everything done yeah and and sometimes it just it just it, it goes faster than other times but but everybody ever I've never had anything other than a great guest They're, they've all been special and extraordinary and I've learned something from every single one of them. Wow. Do you do any uh, private teaching? See, I never took any piano lessons, so I don't think I have the right yeah. to wrap anybody's knuckles. But, yes, I mean, I, what? Tell me. Well, you have something, I'm sure, that a lot of piano teachers don't have. Practical experience and, and how to use your ear, how to play what your ear is telling you and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's valuable. Um, if anything, and I, and I have had a number of students over the years, some, some stride students who want to learn how to do that because it's just something that's so old that it's uh, very few people do it anymore. Although there's, there's a wave of young players coming up right now who are fascinated for that very reason, that something is so old that they're listening to really old scratchy recordings and saying, oh, this is great. And learning it from the sheet as well, although sometimes the sheet music doesn't capture what the, what the live recording does, the, 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 the groove, the, the bounce. So um, it, if I have students, and, and every once in a while, I'll, I'll do some clinics overseas and, and in colleges, and I love it because um, people are surprised at how much they know already. And how, and how, in other words, I remember in Australia talking to some kids, and I, I brought them all on stage. before I got there an hour and a half before the show, and I said, how many chairs can we fit on stage? Put all the chairs up on stage so they can actually. I took the top off the piano so they can see everything, all the internal mechanisms, and they, they like that. And, and I, I, I played something for them, and I, and um, it's, it was a Christmas carol that had some Australian words, so it's sort of like the Jingle Bells, Batman smells, Robin laid an egg sort of thing. But in Australia, you know, doggy in the boot, you know, the old pesky ute, and all these Australian slang things, and they love that. And I said, how many times have you listened to your not Walkman, it's iPad, and and you heard a, a note or a word that you wanted that you changed to your own, that you changed something that was it wasn't Lady Gaga's, it wasn't Fifty Cents or somebody's, and, and it's, they all they uh, unanimously agreed. Yes, I've changed something. So, well, you're improvising. The, the fancy word to describe that is improvising. They're making something up that wasn't there before. You're doing a variation on something that was already there. I said, if you can do that. Um, it's a, it's a very small step to improvising everything. I was listening to you play Green Dolphin Street, and I heard you play Frankie and Johnny. <laughs> in really? There. Yeah, really. I knew you were going to say that, or I thought you would. Really? Like, it almost was so 
subtly done, but I'm pretty sure it was. But I, I remember at the moment listening to it, I wonder if you knew that you did that, or if it was just so, it, it was a, a half a quote. I, Almost. I think I remember the. I think I remember the venue. I think it was the Artist Quarter in Minneapolis. And you probably saw it on YouTube. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Alex Hahn. Yeah. Yeah. Alto sax player, kid. Yeah, he's about twenty-four. Plays with Marcus Miller. He's unbelievable. I did a gig with him when he was seventeen. In any case, um, yeah, the the spare parts. Teddy Wilson, the great pianist, who's uh, who's centennial this year, the twenty-fourth of November, uh, nineteen twelve to twenty twelve. He used to call them spare parts. Where you'd be playing a song, and all of a sudden you'd hear, and you'd sneak it in there. It's a joke. It's a little jest. It's a little sneaky thing that it fits. Some people, you know, force impose them and, and, and go out of their way to put in something silly. But yeah. uh, especially it, at Christmas time. <laughs> especially at Christmas time, right? <laughs> well, this is a you know a good good thirty five Christmas girls. If I hear somebody play a spare part of a song. Like Frankie and Johnny, if there's a bridge, I, I will try to answer that person by doing the a quote from the bridge. That, that's my drill for. I see. But but the spare parts, I love it. That's um, that's a, a, a to me when when somebody does that, when someone takes a, a snip of another song and puts it in on the fly in real time, in, in, into the song and then goes back to what they were doing. Kind of, oh, where was I? Uh, that's a, a pretty high uh, level of uh, uh, human expression. If you think about it, they're they're already improvising over chords a new melody in real time, not the slow motion composition. You know, Wayne Shorter said something about composition is improvising in slow motion and improvising is composition in fast motion or in real time, which I, I like that quote. Um, but they're they're on the fly improvising something and then taking a snip of another song. Well, I think I'll take this one out of orbit for a second and put it in and then I'll put it back. Right, because you have to know what pitch that quote starts on too, right? Yeah. You can't just like, mm -hmm. unless you're doing it out of key on purpose or something. Like that. Well, that used to happen a lot. I remember I had a gig with a, a gentleman named, named uh, John Foshager, and <clears throat> we used to quote things like Daniel Boone, and just silly stuff that didn't have any business being in the, uh, uh -huh. uh, and, and we'd, we'd make it off key just to, to see if, <laughs> to see if we get anybody to turn their head, which <laughs> after a while we'd be like, come on, you, don't you hear that? Okay, we'll make it a flat nine too. <laughs> do you do you um, have a manager or anything like that? Or you just sort of handle your own. My manager is, is the, the cell phone in my pocket, yeah. which I hope I turned off. Yeah. But yeah, the the, the people call, and uh, I, have, I have enough work to keep me happy. I guess that's that's a good place to be, where you're um, you have enough steady work to continually. To do something seven days a week if you want to, but not enough, not so much work that your your life is dictated by your fame. Yeah. I'm, I'm not famous, which is I'm in a type of music that is not popular music, so that's 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 fine with me. I have a student who is a very good piano player, you know, in high school, and I'm I struggle with advising him. He wants to go into music now. I don't think he's going to be. I don't think he has the innate ability to be the next Bill Evans or that kind of thing. But I think he could make a living in the music business. And I I guess I'm not sure what to tell him. Do you have advice for young musicians how to get ahead? Um, what's motivating him to play right now? Does, I mean, if, if someone has, I mean, some musicians come from a place where they have stage mothers or fathers who go on, go be the next American Idol, and other kids just, they, they can't even help it, they just, they love to play so much, it's what they're naturally inclined to do, and they're brave enough to pursue it, and to have the attention span to do it for hours and hours a day, so if he's one of those, I'm assuming it's a young gentleman, if he has enough, if he has the interest in doing it all the time, and is willing to give up everything, I hear this sometimes from you know, wealthy folks who will come along and say, you know, I was a lawyer, I was a doctor all my life, and I'd give anything to, to do what you do. Guess what? You do have to give up everything. Look at me. I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm sitting on Fort Knox, you know. <clears throat> and, and that's the way it is. And if, if, if your, your student is ready for this, that it's not going to be necessarily, who knows, maybe, maybe, maybe he will be the next big thing. Maybe he'll stumble on something and really get into it. Um, it sounds like he's into it already. Yeah. 
he is the type of he, that's his situation. He loves to play. It's it's sort of ironic now that to to pursue that life, we have to give up everything. First, most people have to go pay fifty grand to go to Berkeley every year. You know the investment to put into it to get right. to that place right. where you're not going to be rich yeah. is although a dichotomy of some. Although there is that, that one lucky person who breaks through and you never know who it's going to be. You know, sometimes you know, the, 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 the nerdy kid with the horn rim glasses uh, ends up, not saying that's your student, but I'm saying that sometimes the, the, the least likely to succeed, you know, I, I don't even remember this kid in high school. How did they, how did they, 10,000 bucks a gig? Jeez, what happened? It could happen, you know. Yeah. You never know what the next big thing is going to be and you never know if, if they they come up who knows? I mean, Thelonious Monk, I'm, I'm certain, was not thought uh, is, is going to be the next Art Tatum in his day. It probably, they probably thought he doesn't sound like him. He's gonna, but he carved out his own thing, yeah. and it was extraordinary in its, in its own way. But you know, you you, know, you you never know what you're going to get, and that's that's the beauty of jazz anyway. You never know what you're going to get from moment to moment, or over the course of your lifetime. Um, are there is there such a thing as a wrong note? No. No. Are you no, sure about no, that? No, no. Well, if you're playing, okay, if you're playing, uh, you know, uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, yes, uh, there's a wrong note there. If you're jazz, there was a great TED um, feature that Stefan Harris did called um, There Are No Wrong Notes on the Bandstand. Meaning, in a jazz combo setting, they were playing a sort of an F kind of suspension thing together, a little quartet. Uh, Stefan playing vibes, and there was a pianist and a drummer and a bass player. And he asked the pianist, he said, hit an F sharp, which is about as harsh as it gets, okay, uh, to most Western ears out of the 12 possible notes in the scale. That's, that's the hardest. He played that, and everybody kept on playing in F. And he said, now, to most of you that sounds wrong. However, let's do this. They did the same thing. They play, they've vamped in this thing in F, and he played F sharp. Everybody followed along the F sharp thing this time. He said, "Now, the only reason that the notes sounded wrong in the first place is because we didn't follow it. When we follow it, and Frank Zappa says exactly the same thing. Whenever they made a goof on stage, and they always had these very intricate arrangements, if somebody had a goof, the goof became the new thing. They said, oh, we love it. We love it. They follow the mistake. And the mistake became the thing until another mistake came along." They live for mistakes. There'd be no laughter in a perfect world. So, are there any wrong notes in the bandstand? Um, if you know something, if you're playing tender ballad and you're gonna, that's being being obnoxious about yeah. it. But if you're if uh, in a in a hard bop kind of a situation, I don't, I don't think so. In in most situations, um, no, I would say there uh, a wrong note is a rarity. Okay. I'll, I'll compromise that much. All right. I, I like the description. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different thoughts on it. You know, you can go on you on the, on the internet and get all kinds of people talking about it. And, uh, and some people have said you have to you have to keep working on that note. What do you, you know. What do you think? I mean, are there other any? Well, I'm, you know, I'm I'm more of a I'm I'm changing my mind some. I used to think, yeah, there's definitely wrong notes that you can play, and I've heard people play them. But then I started to think about, usually, you know, if Stefan Harris plays an F sharp in that thing, it's different than when a, a, a junior high kid plays an F sharp, because Stefan will do it with attack, with purpose. A junior high kid maybe just is making He's, he's just hitting a note. Very good point. Yeah, and he doesn't know what exactly to do with it. And so then it becomes, sort of sits there feeling wrong. I guess I was thinking about being in a gig situation yeah, somewhere. Yeah, no, but, that, but well, that when, was my when you're, when you're learning, oh my gosh, yeah. And then transcriptions, I mean, when I was coming up, I would I would transcribe solos note for note and learn them note for note. And mm. entire, yeah, that's, at, at that stage... Yeah, I would say uh, stick to the ink at that at that stage mm -hmm. early enough, right? And, and then and then uh, learn learn what, what what it's supposed to sound like. What's I guess well again what's it supposed to sound like? I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe the wrong note thing is going to be the next big thing. I don't yeah. know. That's. Okay. 
make a possibility. What's up in the near future for you? The immediate future, um, I'm going to take a 2 a.m. bus back to New York oh, yeah. City right. and go out to Scarsdale, play a gig. Uh, and then, let's see, I'm going to Azerbaijan about a week. Wow. Never been. I want to see it. I want to see the Caspian Sea. But I hang out. It's just, I don't know, a soul there. I just want to take a look, see what, see what I can hear, see what I can hear. Uh, yeah. Well, you seem innately curious. And I also was thinking a couple times. I said I should get you and Phil Schaap together, and you can, you can have a. He's the Jeopardy he, champion. He, he, he oh, he would he would mop the floor with me. He knows every he knows everything. He does, but but you seem to have a pretty encyclopedic knowledge of what I, you I, need anyway. I know some straight bizarre facts, which I think create the illusion that I'm smarter oh. than I actually am, which is that's. <laughs> But no, I, I love uh, I love the trivia and I love the, the birthdays and the numbers. Yeah, yeah, it's all fun. It's all right. Well, I have to have my open house here, so I'm going to wrap up and uh, maybe down the line we'll do part two. Monk, you are way too kind to me. <laughs> I'm grateful. How cool is your name? I mean, for well, who, it, for it who were you named? Uh, actually, it, it was a nickname I picked up in college, and most people thought it was about Thelonious. But actually, it was about a blue coat with a hood. Wow. And it stuck with me, and eventually I became the name. So You were wearing hoodies before they were cool. Yeah. Uh, check <laughs> you guess. out. Well, thanks for your time today, and I hope your, your gig here at Hamilton goes well and that you make your 2 a.m. bus. We'll, we'll make sure that you're there. Well, thanks a lot.